Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Welcome back, everyone. We're here today with our Total Wellness Tuesday episode of the week, episode 2447. If you want to head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2447. Now, over there will be all of the resources, all the scientific studies that I'll be quoting from today's show. But really, what I want to share with you is, and I think it's a very important uh, scientific discovery that we're learning even more and more about, but it's the most inflammatory foods really in the world uh, and why fasting and other uh, caloric deficits can help so much. Now, again, I am don't, uh, you know that I'm a huge believer in intermittent fasting, that I believe is the closest thing that we have right now to the fountain of youth, but you also know that it can be overdone, especially based on a person's bioindividuality, right? If they're someone that loses weight more easily, if they're someone that's a much more fatigued, if they have blood sugar dysregulation, uh, if they have thyroid issues, it can, be, it can be well overdone. And I also don't believe in massive caloric deficits, and the reason is that after a certain period of time, you are going to become far more catabolic. Um, your macros might be okay, your protein, carbs, and fats, but eventually your micros are not going to be there. You simply won't be getting enough vitamins, minerals, omegas, et cetera, and that will eventually lead to much faster aging in the body. Thinner skin, thinning hair, uh, more wrinkles, weakness, dry skin, fatigue, lower energy, lower libido, lower endurance, et cetera. So, you know, again, all of these things have to be balanced. So if anybody's telling you that everybody should only eat one meal a day, it's just, it's simply incorrect. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's a time and place maybe for an individual to do that, but really difficult to get in the amount of micronutrients you need, easy to get in your macros and calories in one meal a day, uh, but also can be quite dis- uh, stressful on the digestive system, putting in that much food in one meal again. But a lot of people, after they've been fasting for a long period of time, uh, their metabolic rate drops dramatically and they may only eat need 1,000 to 1,200 calories a day. Again, at 1,000 calories a day, really difficult to get in the micros you need. Yes, you can do it with supplementation, but we should always look towards whole food first and then use your nutritional supplements as a supplement to your healthy diet. Again, I do believe in that, uh, but I just want to make sure we're looking at food as our fuel for our body. And that's because, and I'm about to share with you right now, you can't just eat any foods like all day long. And even if you meet your macros, like if it meets your macros, there's a lot of people out there just talking about that. And I get it. I understand it because here's the thing. When you're a teenager and in your 20s, um, you can basically eat whatever you want for a lot of people. And you are able to burn it up. Your metabolism is typically pretty high. And um you don't feel the effects of inflammation at at a younger age as much. Once you start to get your mid-30s, later 40s, it's a totally different story. And again, when I was a 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 22-year-old personal trainer, uh, you know, strength and conditioning coach at at 22, you you don't even, you can't have the mindset because you don't have the life experience. You've never really experienced it. And so it's like, it's challenging to talk with your clients about that because um, you don't necessarily feel it in your own body the same way. Again, I just want to put that out there. It's just something to think about. But Inflammation is and is um, affected by the rain barrel effect, right? So, like, the more inflammation you accumulate in your body, the more symptoms you have, which is like the brain fog, the skin rashes, maybe the headaches and migraines, the lower mood, the autoimmune issues, etc. Well, that inflammation, it, a lot of it is caused by lifestyle and and predominantly I would say by our food maybe over exercising certainly that that can happen weight training or overdoing cardio um, and there are a lot of other factors obviously there's gut based health etc that we're not going to get too deep into today but the biggest one that we always have to look at is we're either adding more inflammatory foods to our body or less inflammatory foods. And I've done a lot of podcasts before. I'm going to link up a couple of those uh, specific ones today at stephencabral.com forward slash 2447. And one of them I want to do is on 
uh, the healthiest fats. The other one I want to link up is, um, you know, the two uh, most detrimental foods to your health that we're going to talk, be talking about here today because they are highly inflammatory. And uh, then I'll also link one up on probably like the two most important foods that if you can only focus on those two for metabolism and, and overall um, metabolic health, we, sh- we should probably do that. So let's dive right into it. Most inflammatory foods, this is actually published quite some time now. This is in, uh, and I'm going to do a follow-up podcast on this, so definitely stay tuned to the next week or two. But this one is on, this was went out to 9 million physicians uh, and what to recommend for their patients. It was uh, really nicely, I thought it was a well-written uh, journal article. And it talked about just the two most important things that if you can only focus on these for your patients, what would it be? And it was focusing on reducing, and again, stay with me for a moment because I know many people are going to jump out of their seats here, focusing on reducing meat, dairy, and eggs, and processed foods such as white sugar and flour-based products. Now, so if I look at those, I understand there's a lot of people out there just saying there's nothing wrong with butter. There's nothing wrong with some cheese. There's nothing wrong with, you know, grass-fed meat, those types of things. And we're going to talk about that, all right? So, um, for the most part, a lot of people listening to this podcast and others are actually choosing the uh, better foods for their health. Sometimes what we're saying is it can be overdone though. Now, if you're not overdoing it, uh, then you're doing great, which is fantastic. And so now I always say, then if you've got it, let's, let's help then teach other people. But here's the issue. With a lot of meat, dairy, and eggs. Now, let me put a little disclaimer as well. Um, I don't consume dairy, but I do consume uh, meat, chicken, poultry, and, and eggs. Um, not as many eggs, but I'm, I'm not against them, okay? So you just kind of look at you know what works best for your body as well. So I'm not saying that I don't consume them. I do. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. And then uh, what about white sugar processed flour? Well, sure, I do on occasion. Those would be what I consider, uh, you know, a flex meal or cheap meal. Like on a Friday night, if I go out with my family, maybe I might have pasta. Okay, so that is my flex. Now that's not every day. And this is what it's important to look at it. But the science behind this is really strong now. And again, I'll be sharing this on a follow-up podcast as well. Studies done with not just 5,000 people or 50 people, and not just done on uh, laboratory uh, mice or rats, but actually done on over 100,000 people. One study on 400,000 people, another. What we look at is the most inflammatory markers from eating the meat, dairy, eggs, or processed food is actually an increase in what's called, um, well, it's an increase in interleukin-6. IL-6 is one of the markers they looked at. This is an inflammatory marker. One of the reasons why it's important that this one is studied is because essentially um, a lot of the foods that we just mentioned can double your IL-6 within just three to six hours. And believe it or not, that basically doubles your... uh, cause for all inflammatory marker-led diseases, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure and stroke, uh, and many others. So it's, it's an important one to look at that because that can lead to um, sudden cardiac death or heart attacks, and it can lead to high blood pressure, et cetera. It can lead to migraines and other, other issues too. But it came from the arachidonic acid in many cases. And I want to get down to this because this is an omega-6 fatty acid. And so when we look at this and what uh, arachidonic acid actually produces in the body, it's something called prostaglandins. And so what I'll, what I think I'll do is I'm actually going to link up one of my charts uh, for you on arachidonic acid. If you head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2447, you can actually see what I mean and why it's very different than when I talk about omega-3s. So arachidonic acid uh, comes from uh, any processed hydrogenated oil, so like think of your um, soy bean oils, think of your safflowers, different items like that. If they're heated and exposed to greater amounts of heat, it can be it can be a real issue. And it also comes from things that have higher amounts of saturated fat. 
Typically, red meat would have some of the highest levels of arachidonic acid, but it can be all the way down to saturated fats in uh, poultry, in egg yolks, in coconut oil, etc. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't eat any of these, but I think it's important to understand that, that this can lead to um, certain uh, lipotoxins in the body, lipopolysaccharides. It can lead to uh, the higher amounts of inflammation that we spoke about. Now, the nice thing is there are ways to be able to block these inflammatory markers so that you don't have to be devoid in your diet of these items. But without a doubt that this is this is actually quite serious and it does increase all-cause mortality. Now, it's not just when you're eating these this one time, like, oh, if you survive the next three to six hours, you're going to be okay. It's not necessarily about that. It's the accumulation on a daily basis that keeps the inflammation going. So how do we uh, how do we blunt the effects of this inflammation? Again, this is something that I've been fortunate enough to know about for quite some time because when I wrote, uh, I, I wrote over 1,200 um, articles for uh, Condé Nast and they got published on uh, Self Magazine, Self.com. They got published on Nutrition Data and, uh, and it was a great experience. And the person that head up that program actually wrote a book on inflammation. So I was fortunate, this is way back in like 2007 and uh, might, maybe even earlier, but I did it for uh, about three years. And what they had was they had a, an IF factor, so an inflammatory factor of all foods. And so you go to look at the actual inflammation that each food caused in the body. And so yes, there's an inflammation from meat, dairy, eggs, and a lot of these animal-based proteins or animal-based foods. Uh, but certainly there was inflammatory factors from all the processed foods. The processed foods would be things made from basically packaged in a box, uh, packaged in a bag, something like that, where the shelf life is you know, six months, a year, et cetera. And it's made from some type of flour where if you put it between your hands and you rub them together, if you can hear me doing that, right, on audio, um, then it just dissolves. Obviously, that can spike blood sugar, but it can also create inflammatory markers in the body, especially if it's coming from like a glyphosate-laden gluten wheat-based product, right? So that's a big factor. Now, here's the interesting thing. And, and again, I learned this, uh, I was fortunate enough to learn this now over 15 years ago, is that you are able to blunt the effect of this inflammation or even reduce it in two ways. The first one is that you can actually choose meat, dairy, or eggs that have a better omega-6 to omega-3 profile and that are leaner. So what does that mean? Okay. So it means that if the red meat that you are eating comes from a cow that was basically factory farmed, it's going to be very high in inflammatory omega-6s, very high in fat, so it's going to have more of the arachidonic acid, and uh, it's going to be lower in omega-3s. So whenever that is the case, you're going to have far higher levels of omega-6s and inflammation of the body, without a doubt. Okay, so the first thing that you could do is choose a grass-fed or grass-finished meat or a pastured chicken or pastured eggs. That means that they're going to have a better omega-6 to omega-3 profile. They will still be inflammatory. There's no way around that, but they will be less inflammatory and far less inflammatory than the factory-fed ones or the you know, factory-based chickens and eggs, et cetera. So that's your first step. Now, your next step could, again, if you're not sensitive to high purine-based foods, you may actually choose sometimes to eat game meat. And that could be something like uh, venison or elk uh, or buffalo, et cetera. And the reason why this is an even better choice is because they're far leaner. Now, a lot of people don't like them as much. They say they taste more gamey and they don't have as much flavor. Well, a lot of times it's the fat that's adding the flavor. So that's the issue. And so what do you do? Well, you, first you have to, you wanna properly cook those so you don't overcook them. That's a big part of it. The second is adding spices that you like that gives that the flavor that you enjoy. And I'm gonna give you another one in just a moment. So that's important. So still inflammatory, but nowhere near as inflammatory, like not even close. And, and again, this is interesting because the processed food is the same way. If you choose more of a whole grain processed food, then it's less inflammatory than the ones that are just the enriched uh, white flour, okay? So important to look at those two. Now, here's the other piece to it. You can add a healthy fat to any one of these 
and actually blunt the effect of that inflammation, which I found remarkable in the studies. So they found just adding an avocado, a half an avocado, to a beef burger, even the factory farmed ones, greatly blunted the effect of the arachidonic acid and the other inflammatory markers. Now, the inflammatory markers uh, are everything from uh, the greater amount of branched-chain amino acids in the body. Again, I'm not speaking negatively about branched-chain amino acids, but I am talking about all-cause mortality, uh, the effects on um, IGF-1, uh, the effects of the greater accumulation of toxins in red meat. Like That's one of the bigger reasons as well. They're just exposed to more. They carry more and they hold more in their fat. So that's why the more fat you eat from an animal, well, the more potential exposure uh, that you would have. Again, human accumulate the same way. They accumulate a lot of these heavy metals and plastics and pesticides and phthalates inside of their fat as well. Okay. So adding olive oil to a meal or avocado can actually blunt that effect. Adding just an ounce of nuts, believe it or not, to a meal can blunt the effect. I found this to be pretty amazing. And it goes back to, and I want to link this up as well. I'm going to link up... Um, a, a podcast on the Mediterranean diet and another one on monounsaturated fats. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've a podcast on like, if you were going to make a bet on what type of fat is healthiest, uh, you have to bet on monounsaturated fats. I mean, you really do. And the reason is, is those are most associated with a decrease in all cause mortality. And that includes cancer as well. And I find that to be pretty amazing. And now we find, okay, if we add those and we add maybe something higher in omega threes to a meal that's higher in omega sixes, it helps blunt the effects. And that's because the EPA can actually decrease the prostaglandin load because there is a there can be given preference from EPA to uh, arachidonic acid. We actually test this as well. So that's just our, our inflammation test. You can find that if you want to know your omega-6 to omega-3 score, you can certainly do that. Uh, that's just at stephencabral.com forward slash labs. You'd be able to find that. You can run it with your own naturopathic doctor or, or integrative health practitioner level two as well. Extremely important to understand that that even if maybe if you're eating out, you might want to just add a little olive oil, a little bit of um, avocado, or maybe you're just taking a little bit of omega threes. You can even just take two soft gels of omega threes if you want. We have a great one, daily omega three support. But again, use whatever one your um, health practitioner is recommending to you. This is one of the reasons why they may help so well uh, is uh, too in all the different studies. But let me take it one step further. So here's the interesting thing: even if people eat an inflammatory diet, and even uh, if they're not going to overall choose better sources of their uh, meat, dairy, and eggs, uh, they can balance it by adding more vegetables and or doing uh, intermittent fasting as well. So all of the people that are doing the carnivore diet. I know the carnivore diet is always morphing, right? So like now all of a sudden as a carnivore, you're eating fruit and honey and like, it's, it's completely absurd, like completely ridiculous. Okay. So now you're really just talking about a paleo diet, right? I mean, like what, what are we talking about? So, cause the carnivore doesn't eat fruit, but anyway, I digress. It's just, again, it's all fad based uh, marketing. So let's just say you're on a true carnivore diet and you're only eating meat. The problem is, is that you are getting all that inflammation. Now the, the, in reality, um, you can easily blunt that if you just want to eat a lot of meat by getting some vegetables in there. If you just, I don't know what carnivore diet you want to call it at that point, but like, what are we doing? Like, are we talking about health or like, what are we talking about? Because the like, science clearly backs this up. And I learned this again, many, many years ago. Um, and from that, from the book that I was talking about, and you were able to look at your inflammatory load for the day by balance, right? It's always about balance that we talk about, like creating dynamic equilibrium in your body. So if you're eating some inflammatory foods, Eat some anti-inflammatory foods, vegetables, fruits, um, nuts, uh, the, all the things that people don't want to eat, right? Because they, they make up things like plant toxins, et cetera, that um, are, are completely misunderstood. But I'll, I'll, I have many videos on that too, but I can certainly uh, create more you know, as needed. But that would help imbalance the inflammatory load. So at the end of the day, you're at a net negative for inflammation. That's the goal, right? So like, I don't own any stock in any of these foods. I don't sell any farm-based foods. But you know, if I did, I'd be recommending, and I still recommend to this day, uh, try to shop locally, right? Like try to know your your farmer. Try to get meats and eggs. Uh, and if you consume dairy, the dairy typically is raw. It, that's its best form for sure. Sheep and goat is even better. Eggs should be pastured. Chicken should be pastured. Try to get more game meat, some venison, elk. Uh, buffalo rather than maybe cow-based meat all the time. And the last part is intermittent fasting. Um, 
and or caloric restriction. Because they find that even if you're doing everything wrong, and I know that you're not, but some people are, even if they're doing everything wrong, if you can get in 12 to 16 hours a day of intermittent fasting and or eat less calories than your body needs per day, it's, it, redu- it helps to reduce all major causes of death. And that's, that's impressive as well. So that's why, you know, the first thing I try to help people with is like, listen, if we can't change all your meals, I totally understand. Can we add more things in, healthy things, rather than even subtract in the beginning? And can we stop eating at 6 p.m., two, three, four hours before bed? The more, the better. And then can we not maybe eat until 8 a.m., a couple hours after you wake up in the morning? Because if we can do that, then we're already so far ahead of the game. And that's because less inflammatory foods are then coming in for 12, 14, 16 hours a day. So now we have a chance to lower our inflammatory load. There's less for our body to do. That's amazing. We get a better balanced blood sugar. And then total calories, if you reduce total calories, then your body is at, again, a net deficit. And what does it do? Well, it uses the branched chain amino acids, it uses all the things that you're putting in uh, to fully utilize them because your body's actually breaking down a little bit more than it should be building up. Now, in the long run, I don't think that that's a positive thing. I think it leads to osteoporosis. I think it leads to, you know, those hip fractures later in life. I think it leads to uh, atrophy with muscles. I mean, we know that, right? It's shown by the science. So at the very least, if you are a practitioner, get your client doing that intermittent fasting. Get them not overdoing their calories. That's why, again, like a good nutrition plan is the good first place to start. Then begin to improve the quality of your food. Less uh, items coming from a box or a bag, right? Unless it's like some frozen veggies or something like that. But like it pro- talking about processed foods, vegetables that are frozen are not processed. They're just taken hopefully picked ripe and then frozen, right? And then when you're choosing your quality of your meat, you're going, and I'm, I'm going to do a follow-up on this, but your meat, your dairy, your eggs are more from that pastured natural version. And you're just trying to reduce maybe the total amount. So maybe instead of it being at three to five meals per day, it's at one meal or two meals per day rather than all of them. And we can start to then decrease the net inflammatory load throughout the whole day. And then balancing that with some fruits and vegetables that, again, I I know people try to fight this, but even the carnivores can't deny it anymore because most of them are switching now to a diet that includes some fruit and some vegetables, the ones that they deem okay, of course. Uh, But this is important to look at that because those are the things that help balance inflammation. And so I know that this is always a controversial topic when talking about nutrition, but again, my end game is just to help people understand what a good lifelong nutrition plan looks like. Maybe you're not doing it for the short term, but lifelong. And then this is the longest people in the world, um, and I'll get into that more in the next show, so, so do stay tuned for that. They're eating this way. You know, they are doing their own intermittent fasting. They are eating more of a plant-based nutrition plan. I'm not saying that they don't eat meat and dairy and eggs and those types of things. Again, I, I do it myself, so I'm not saying that but it's less of and they're balancing that inflammatory load with herbs and spices and healthy fats and they're using things like olives and olive oil and avocados so hopefully this was helpful much more to come i know i can't cover every nuance in 20 minutes but uh i did my best and of course if this was helpful do feel free to share it with anyone else you believe it could serve Are you ready to heal yourself and then go on to heal others? If so, the Integrative Health Practitioner Institute can help you discover proven functional medicine protocols that blend the best of seven different healing disciplines from around the world. I personally share with you the exact handouts and protocols I use in my private practice that enable people to get well, lose the weight, and live longer, stronger. I want to pass this information on to the next generation of health coaches, and that is exactly why I created IHP. We are the future of the health coaching industry, and the skills and knowledge you will learn will make you an in-demand certified health coach anywhere in the world. Although we have many medical professionals taking the IHP certifications, no experience is necessary, and half our members have no previous health certifications. At the Integrative Health Practitioner Institute, our motto is a health coach in every home. Our goal is that you take this knowledge and then share it with family, friends, loved ones, your community, or in a practice where you create a career you love and can be proud of. The global IHP community is filled with some of the most kind and caring people in the world, and we can't wait to welcome you into our world soon. For more information or to set up a discovery call with one of our IHP Health Coach graduates, simply head over to integrativehealthpractitioner.org.